Okay, we're all started there. Kind of looking um, in the waiting room here, just admitting a few more people before we get started. Okay, um, in front of you, us here is just the training uh, link with all of our training sessions. And this is in a draft uh, mode right now. We um, will probably be making some changes to this. Hence, we don't have the links out here yet to register, um, except for the next couple. Um, but we do have um, upcoming training in a couple weeks inventory again, um, we're going to talk about reports and uh, the system options, in particular the import option. We'll be covering that in more detail. We have um, a lot of changes that are being made to that right now, so those changes should be implemented by the time we have that session. And I'll be wanting to go in and show you guys how to mass load items, update existing items via spreadsheets in that session. Um, so today is going to be more basic. We're just going to cover the transaction menu. I do have a PowerPoint out here. It's a very basic um, PowerPoint. <clears throat> it just provides, I'll bring it up here. It just provides um, just um, sections on the transaction menu basically with links. Um, I'm not sure if this would be helpful for when you do trainings with your districts, but I just kind of wanted to provide a slide for each option and uh, you guys can use this. I won't be using this today. I will be actually going into the actual instance and running through examples and things with you. But yeah, it just kind of goes through um, each of the options in the transaction menu. And um, with the link, you'll see links here at the top that takes you right to the documentation for more information. And um, this is the same slide that I covered last week regarding our future releases. We did release 1.8 last week, which um, mainly consisted of the filter fix that we had uh, when we added the filters, the less than great, greater than filters, it broke the wildcard filter a while back. And so 1.8 fixed that wildcard filter. So now you can go in and use the percent sign to do wildcards. And I'll show you that here in a little bit when we get into the items grid. Um, so it just talks about, you know, upcoming release fixes as well, some bug fixes. We do have some miscellaneous sort option fixes, not any deal breakers, um, but just things that need to get cleaned up. I'm sorry, not sort, I mean splits. Um, so there's a few of them listed here. So like I said, not a, not a deal breaker, but, um, but yeah, it's uh, just some little cleanup stuff that needs to be done. Um, one of the biggest ones that uh, we uncovered was not being able to modify the tag number. You're always able to modify the tag number classic. So um, that is something that uh, we need to get taken care of so that they can modify it in case they entered in the wrong thing. And then um, our next inventory session, like I said, will be on the 11th. So our next release goes out on the 4th, which has which should contain a lot of those import updates. So then we'll be able to review those on the 11th together. So that's basically not a whole lot of slides on here, but just kind of a starting point for you in case you do um, need a, a PowerPoint for your sessions. So that's the PowerPoint that's attached right here. Also last week's uh, regarding the imports is available out here as well as the recording. So we did go over about an hour, 20 minute session, but um, I felt it was pretty worthwhile um, going over the import log and, and going into the different errors. Um, so the recordings out here as well as the PowerPoint that um, we covered during that session. So any questions so far before we get started? All right. I'll go ahead and I'm gonna move over to the actual uh, homepage for inventory. And like I said, we're gonna tackle the transaction menu today. And so this is very similar to what you're used to seeing in Classic. We have, um, in Classic, it was the EIS screen, EIS SCN. And within that menu, we had several options. And so we had the acquisitions, 
um, dispositions, items, pending items, and transfers. So in the manual, I'll go to that, and I'll go to the transactions. In here, we have a little guide as to what the existing program is and what it should be. Um, so I'm sorry, what our existing program is and what it was in Classic. So the acquisitions is the acquisition transaction program under EIS screen in Classic. Same thing with dispositions, items, pending items, and transfer. So it kind of provides a guide as to um, what um, was the Classic counterpart, basically. Um, I do have a note up here as well that uh, <clears throat> the pending file will not be imported in. So I, we talked about that last week as well. And so um, whatever pending file they have out there now, and if they're trying to get caught up on inventory, that's great. They can you know, pull that information in and create the items in there in Classic um, before they migrate over. Otherwise, um, if they're using USSR right now for uh, USAS processing, they'll be able to recreate the pending file in inventory. So, um, and um, one of our pre-close or pre-import steps is to run the pending file in Classic and just as a reference so that when they do recreate the pending file and redesign, um, they can compare that with what they have before. Um, they probably wind up doing some cleanup and redesign as well when they pull, but uh, we'll get into that here in more detail once we get to that pending item option. But I do just <clears throat> want you to, to know that that will not get migrated over. One other area within here is the item section, the maintenance area, the maintenance information that was in classic. I think that was on the second screen of item screen that will not migrate over as well. So we had a um, conversations with the inventory focus group on that and um, so others as well. No one really used it. Um, if they did, um, you know, that is information um, that can possibly get pulled into other fields like the user defined fields and stuff like that. If um, they really want that information loaded in, but otherwise I believe most people use spreadsheets to track maintenance on specific things like busing and uh, the vehicles and stuff like that. So um, that will not get migrated over. We don't have a section for maintenance in the redesign. Okay, so let's get started here. I'm going to go back to my instance. And again, this is sample scrambled data, uh, anonymized data. So um, some things may look a little funny in here. So just bear with me on that. Um, but you'll get the idea, you know, of how to do the processing once we run through this. So transactions. Uh, the first one I'm going to go into today is items. And again, um, the grids are fabulous in here. Um, it's so much better than Classic's item screen. Um, you can filter by the fields that are most important to you. And off to the right-hand side there, you'll see the little blue icon here that allows you to go in and select the specific um, or, um, fields that, or columns that you want to include or exclude. So um, as you can see here, I can scroll down and see the ones that are selected. We are having a little bit of trouble with this right now in regards to things being selected that aren't showing on the grid. We do have a JIRA issue for that. So if you're like, wait a minute, it's showing serial number, but serial number isn't displayed. We're aware of that and we're gonna get that cleaned up. So, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I have the ones that I feel are the most important or most, most useful for me. And that's basically showing, you know, what's the status of the item? Um, is it capitalized or not? So that's a big one. I love this column because I can see right away which ones are capitalized or which ones aren't. Also the same with the status. Um, and I'm gonna go through and show you some of this filter action here. I can just start typing in A and or I can type in the word active and it's gonna find everything that is currently active on the system. Um, and then here too, I can even narrow it down more and just filter active capitalized assets. Um, and so that's one way of entering the filters. Um, also, if I wanna find something greater than 
Um, so if I go to the original cost and I want to find everything that's greater than um, the capitalized criteria, which I believe is 5,000, it should filter and just pull up everything that is just um, greater than $5,000. So it pulls that stuff up. And so, um, so yeah, so this allows me to do a lot of filtering and things like that. So one other thing too, I wanted to show you is the wildcard filtering. So if I wanna go in here and just find anything that has the word rug in it, it's gonna go out there. And because I wrapped it in uh, the wildcards, it's going to find anything that contains rug within that description. So I could drop one of those if I wanna find everything that ends in rug or begins in rug, I can drop one of the wildcards. Um, but that's basically how the filtering is currently working right now. And I believe those are the only ones we have right now are the less than, greater than, and the wild card, um, the uh, percent sign. I don't believe we have other ones um, yet. So um, again, we would appreciate feedback if you feel that there needs to be others in there. Um, but for right now, this is what we have in redesign. And again, too, I mean, you can just go in if you want to select a specific tag, you just enter it in here and it goes right to that tag and allows you to go in then and edit it, view it, um, if um, delete it. Um, deleting will look, um, it acts the same way and behaves the same way as it did in Classic. So obviously, if you have an active item, um, you can't just go in here and delete it. Um, especially if um, if there you know the gap flag has been set. So if it was created within the year, I believe you can. But if you created this item three years ago, um, you're not able to just to go in and delete that item. So um, I believe if it's capitalized, you certainly can't. Not cap. I'm not 100% sure <laughs> to look at the documentation, but uh, um, and that's only within the open period that you're in. So in these files, it's nice because it tells us what year we currently are in and we're in fiscal year 2020. It's always displayed up here, the district, the user and the year. So, um, you know, in here I have 2020 is open and it is the current year too. So it's the only year actually that I have in here. So obviously when they start, you know, on redesign and they you know continue moving on and they close a year they'll be opening up another year creating another year and opening it and making it current uh, for the next year and the fiscal year grid i'm going to go to that we'll track that so this is what the fiscal year grid looks like underneath core and so obviously once they start open up a new year they'll have another row there for that year so, and when that happens too, uh, the dollar and life limits will carry over into the new year. And we do have an option to change the cap uh, limit that's under the system. And we'll get into that on the 11th when we talk about the system menu. Let me go back to transactions here, go back to items. So like I said, I, I have this set up uh, to uh, what I want on here for the most part. Um, I can slide columns over to move them. So if I want a fund function asset class, I can do that, move those over. Um, so if I don't want the number of items, that isn't something I, you know, really, you know, use a whole lot, I can go ahead and uncheck that to get rid of it. So this is kind of where I'm at. I also like it because I can, you know, basically see um, my original cost and I can see my depreciation. So if I'm tracking depreciation, it's going on that particular item. I know I am because the life to date has a figure and amount in it. Um, so a great way to see almost like a 304 report in a grid is basically what it is. Um, so with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and um, just talk a little bit more about what you're seeing in each of these grids. You obviously can go in and create one, which is what we're gonna do here in a couple minutes. We can export the grid items. So um, what is currently being filtered, or I'm sorry, what is currently being displayed here, all of these um, are gonna get pulled out and um, it'll allow me to go in and make any changes 
and then import that stuff back in. So for example, if I wanted to update the replacement costs and insurable values, I could export this out into an Excel spreadsheet, go into Excel, make those changes, and then use the system import option to update um, the replacement costs and insurable values. And there is, um, this is the option I'm talking about. So um, that is going to be very convenient. Same thing, you can do that for locations, um, you know, a lots of different things. Uh, the biggest things that you probably can't do that for is original cost, fund, function, and asset class because those are all gap related. So we've got those same programs that we had in classic that will allow you to make changes to those, the transfer transactions, acquisitions, um, it'll allow you to, to make updates to those particular fields. Okay. Um, we will cover depreciate here in a little bit. That's another option we'll talk about. Um, within the grid here, you'll see um, a checkbox here, and that's tied to the depreciate. Um, so in classic, the EISD PR program allowed you to depreciate items, um, but it was all or nothing. So I know um, if an auditor said these three particular tags, their life to date is incorrect and they need to be changed. Um, and you need to calculate what the depreciation should be. Uh, you could run in classic the EIS DEPR program in projection mode, find those three tags, find the new calculation, go into item screen and modify those. Um, because if you ran the actual option, it not only would have updated those three tags, it would have updated anything else where the depreciation is off compared to what the system says it is. Well, in here, you can control that a little bit more by selecting those particular items that you want to run the depreciate on. And so, um, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but it does have a projection mode as well where you can generate a report. Um, but, um, but that's what these, these checkboxes are for, it's related to depreciate. Um, and then obviously you have the view, which uh, throws you into that particular item. And if you wanna go right in, straight in and edit it, um, you could click on the edit option and it will take you right into edit mode um, in that particular item. And then the delete. So you can see where um, there are uh, specific things here where the delete is grayed out. And that's because it is um, capitalized. So, and you know, these are all also several years old, but these non-cap items um, that was allowed in classic, um, it allowed you to delete them, even though, um, you know, they are in prior years, but they are non-cap and it says right here, false. So I do have um, the ability to delete that. Um, so, you know, we are making sure that, you know, what we was, you're able to do in classic or restrictions that you had in classic have been applied to the redesign as well. So obviously if you guys run into things where you're like, mm, it's not working the way it was, um, you know, create a ticket and we'll look into it and see what's happening. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and create an item. So I'm gonna click on create here. And what you'll see is this box, this window that comes up, I should say, not a box, a window. And this is like the post acquisition screen in item screen. When you first um, go into item screen in classic, it takes you to that post acquisition screen. And that's basically what this is, allowing us to go in and pull from the pending file. And so um, if I click on the drop down here, I can actually select or I can start typing in a particular one. And I think I may have one here. I'm going to type in 210286. <clears throat> and so you can either type in the PO number or you can go in and scan through and select the one that you want. And so here it filtered it down. And so the one that I want is the base price, this first one. So I'm going to click on that. And you'll notice that it fills almost everything in here. Um, obviously the tag number, we need to put in a tag number and uh, we do have an auto assign option underneath core. 
in the configuration where you can put in like a starting tag number and it will auto assign. So kind of similar to the requisition auto assigning in USAS. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in a tag number that hopefully currently isn't on file. And you'll see that everything else from the pending got pulled in. By default, the type is gonna be acquisition, but same as in classic, you have the payment option as well. Um, the date, and I need to look at this to ensure that it is in fiscal year 20. And so this one isn't, I'm just gonna back up the date here to 2019. <clears throat> Forgive my test files, but that's what I have here. Um, the account code is pulled in. <clears throat> from um, the purchase order, the vendor, the amount. So this is a bus that um, they want to um, put on the system. And so anything else that was brought over is going to be populated already. Obviously, fund, function, and asset class <clears throat> aren't available yet because we're just creating the item. So we have to put that in the next screen. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and continue item. And it's going to take me then to the information, um, the main screen with basically this is the three screens of item screen is what I call it all in one window here. And so it's going to remember some of the stuff I entered in in the prior uh, window, like the tag number and anything else that's coming over from the pending file. So, <clears throat> and you'll notice right away that the capitalized box is checked. Um, because this meets the threshold. Their threshold is, I think, $3,000 and zero life. Um, so the capitalization has been met. And so at this point, I can go in and enter any information in here. So if I've got an item category, so I know that this is, <coughs> excuse me, vehicles or buses or something like that, I can put that in here. Okay, and I got a little bit of a air there. Like I said, these are my test files. Let me try that again. And again, I can go in and select my category code. And I'll do, I had one for vehicles, but. I'll just go ahead and stick, uh, pick one here. Um, I'm not quite sure why I got that error, uh, if it's in regards to something with my test data. So I'm going to look into that. Um, so this is the category, the item categories, what this code is. And then um, I've got my <clears throat> current information. So I have to assign a fund, function, and asset class. And you'll notice that the asset class has already been filled in um, because of the item category. Um, so that category, uh, if it's got an asset class on the category, as well as a life, uh, useful life, then once I enter in the category code, it's gonna populate the asset class and the life expectancy down here. Um, so just like it did in classic, so nothing different there. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick on the fund. So general fund function, I'm gonna say it's down here. I had one for vehicles, but maybe I don't. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pick whatever. Um, and then here, uh, if I have an organization code, I can put that in here, bus garage. If I use condition codes, these are you know all optional location. Um, I can pick a location code here. I know it's in um, the uh, probably maintenance building or something like that. Um, so I can you know start entering one 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 in, or I can select one. So and it automatically defaults to active. And my um, amount that I put in in the prior window for my acquisition amount that got pulled in from the pending file, that gets populated in the replacement cost 
insurable value, and the original cost fields, just like it did in Classic. So those all get populated. And um, anything else I put in here is totally optional. And the next section is my acquisition information. Again, this is populated from the pending file. My acquisition date, which was my invoice date in this case, um, gets populated in here. There is an option underneath core and configuration where if you don't wanna use the invoice date, you wanna use the received date instead, then um, it's going to populate it with the received date. So that's another change that can be made in the configuration screen. So we've got the invoice date, we've got the method here. So by default, it's going to select purchased, but we do have others. So if you're leasing this vehicle, you can select lease. And um, the original cost, obviously. All the rest, um, this one is, is um, optional. Now this beginning balance. Now this is something that um, you guys did not see in Classic. This was kind of a behind the screens field. Um, that stored the beginning balance of an item. And so this gets activated once, like if I add this item this year, when I close out for 20, the beginning balance of this item, which will be the original cost, will be populated um, for the next fiscal year. Because this is a capitalized asset, it's tracking that beginning balance then. It always did that in classic too, you just didn't see it. And when you go in and run reports, like the gap reports, like the 103 and the 104, um, those um, beginning balance amounts then are included in that beginning balance column on those reports. So um, not sure how helpful it is for the end user, but it may be something helpful for the ITC staff for you guys to see that and just see that that's being tracked. So, you know, once I would close out for this year, that should be populated then because it's tracking that as part of my gap uh, reporting. Uh, the depreciation information down here. Um, so it defaults to straight line. Um, we haven't received too much feedback on that yet regarding if that's a good thing or a bad thing or if they would or annoying thing. Um, so if this is something where, um, you know, they don't want the depreciation method um, to default to straight line, then we need to get some feedback from uh, the districts to see if that needs to be changed in the system. But right now it's defaulting to that. And because it's defaulting to straight line, it's going to require a life expectancy as well. Um, and uh, the beginning date, that beginning date will always populate with the acquisition date, but it can be changed. Um, actually in classic, it used to be um, just month, month, year. Um, and so we changed it in here to be just like it is in, um, in, in the, as the acquisition date, we wanted to model it the same way. And so, like I said, the life expectancy was auto-populated because of the item, the, uh, I'm sorry, the category code I entered up here. So because I had one stored in the category uh, underneath core, um, it's going to populate it in here. Um, and then obviously life to date is going to remain zero until I close out for the year. And then it will track the um, depreciation for that year in here. Any lease information is down here. So if I, the acquisition method is leased and I want to enter in the lease information, I can populate it in here. So this is all optional at this point. And then the user defined fields are at the bottom here. So I think I have everything filled in. If I don't, it'll let me know. And so at this time then, um, you, you, there was a little uh, box that popped up at the bottom, ignore that. It's something with um, my connection to my uh, USASR instance in these training files. So you will not see that um, when you guys are, when they're processing. Um, but what it's doing is it's going in then and <clears throat> posting this as an item. And also um, it was on the pending file 
well, now that item has been re removed from the pending file as well, because that purchase order has been turned into a tag. So um, it will go out there. If we go in to look in the pending file and look up that particular purchase order number, it would no longer be there, just like it did in Classic. Once you posted an item for that pending, pending item, um, then it would re remove it from the pending file. And so at this point, 191200 is now an item on the system. Um, will, will there be a demo site available to us in the future? Um, I need to look into that, Nancy, because I know that the Management Council has started setting up um, instances out there in VRA to spin up, you know, test instances and stuff like that. And I believe you guys all have the capability to do that with USAS and payroll. So we need to get something out there with um, inventory as well. So I'm going to write that down um, as a to see where they're at with that, what needs to be done. Okay, and so at this point, my item's been saved, um, and you'll we'll see some options up here. I can go back in and edit this if I forgot something. I can make changes to it. I can close out of this window. Um, I can add an additional acquisition to this. So in classic, you went in and when you first added an item, like I said, it took you to that post acquisition window where you could go in and pull in from the pending file, the first pending item. And then if you had more, you would at that point in classic add additional items. So if you had three items you wanted to pull in from the pending file for that one tag, you would do that all right up front and then you would go into those three screens of item screen, finish the rest of it out and post the tag. And here it's after the fact. So after you add the first item, um, you know, that first pending item, you go to the core area here and add the remaining part for that item, create the item, and then you can go in and add additional acquisitions to that existing item. So when I go in to click on this add acquisition, I can go in and pull in the next one. And I believe I might have that on here. That was 210-286. And uh, one thing right now that, um, and it worked like this in classic too. So I might write this down as well. I'm not sure um, if we can change this, but right now it still shows the one that we just pulled in, the base price one. Um, you know, and now that we posted the item, I um, wonder if we can remove that one. So it just shows what's remaining. So I'm going to write that down. Spending item under. See, you find all these things as you're, you know, keep going in here and, and running items here. Okay. So I need to select this one, the options package. That's the additional acquisition I wanna to post to this existing tag. I just have to be careful that I put in the right tag number and it's 191200. And if I don't know, I can just look up and the tag number's right behind me in the screen behind this one. And so obviously at this point then, I can go ahead and add the information for this again. Um, and I need to backdate that again to 2019. I think I put the 19th in there. And it, obviously it pulls in everything else. You will see a few little differences here. Um, number one is you will see the update original cost um, is checkmarked by default. So what that's saying is I've got an extra, you know, 15,000 that I wanna put on to this bus. Um, and when I do that, I want to add that to my original cost on my existing tag. So now I'll have two acquisitions against this one item. Um, also, you'll see that the fund function and asset class, which is behind us in the screen, is displayed as well. And so at this point, I just click on create and it'll go out there and it will create um, that additional um, acquisition against that tag. So if I exit and close out of here now. 
my original cost has increased by 15,000. So I had, you know, my original amount plus um, the 15,000 equal now my original cost. Now, it does not update replacement cost and insurable value. You notice those are still the original amounts. Um, it did that in classic as well. And so um, if this is something that they need to edit uh, or, you know, to increase that, they would need to go in and edit this item and update those. If that's something where, you know, um, that is getting annoying and they would like that to be updated at the same time, um, we would appreciate feedback on that so we can get an issue created for it. But right now it's behaving like it did in classic um, and it's just updating the original cost. And so at this point then, um, if I had another acquisition to pull in for this existing item, I would just click on add acquisition again and you know keep doing that until I have everything pulled over. So um, I just had two acquisitions against this item. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out of this. And you'll notice that um, that acquisition window still remains open. I do have to close out of that as well. And then if I would go in and look up this tag, it's out there with the correct original cost. Um, and if I wanted to go in and ensure that both acquisitions are on um, are included on that tag, I would go up to acquisitions. And I will see my two acquisitions that were created. So the original one um, for the 82,000 and my additional 15,000. That's basically in a nutshell, how you create an item and uh, redesign. I can also create an item um, without using the pending file. Um, right now, you know, it is set up to talk to USAS. And um, that's one thing when um, you first start up in redesign, you know, like I said, pending file doesn't migrate. So you would go into transactions, into the pending item, and go in and pull from USAS. And when I click on this option, um, it'll ask me for a starting date to, to pull items from. And so that's something that um, they would need to kind of know, you know, what, when are they gonna start pulling? Are they gonna pull it from um, the beginning of this fiscal year? Are they going to pull it from when they started in USAS R? Um, so it's uh, a preference of, um, the district, but just to kind of expand upon this a little bit, and I'm going to go to the uh, pending items chapter. So I'm going to take us back to transactions and click on pending items. And so um, what it's doing is it is going to pull items that are quote marked for inventory. And so part of the post USAS um, import options was to set up the EIS configuration and the pending threshold amounts and it, as part of the post USAS processing steps. So at that time when they started up in USAS, they would have gone into the classic configuration and um, enabled that and then gone into um, to select the pending threshold amounts for that. If it's um, 600 uh, object codes only, and a pending amount of $1,000 um, that would be set up to write, set up right away. So once they started processing invoices in USAS, it would go out there. And if they have a particular PO item that they're invoicing that has a 600 object code in it, and it's over $1,000 when they post that invoice, um, by default, you'll see off to the right-hand side, there's an EIS box. And that should be checked automatically based on you know, their settings. And so once that gets posted, it marks that item for inventory. And so if they have been running the inventory extract report or spreadsheet, I guess you could call it in USSR, it would go out there, find those marked ones, create a spreadsheet that they could have then used in classic to import it into the pending file in there. And the program that they would have run in Classic was EIS IMPR, 
EIS import. Um, if they weren't doing that, and but they have a bunch of items marked for inventory, it's great. They can use the pull from USAS. And if they want to use the time when they first started in USASR as the beginning starting date, uh, it's going to go out there. They click on confirm and it will generate their pending file. So that's basically, you know, kind, kind of what I did with this one. I put in from the beginning and um, then I click on confirm and it just populates this. Um, will they be pulling from USAS periodically or just once they migrate? Um, that's a good question. Um, they will be pulling from USAS periodically because you know it marks those items for inventory on the USAS side, but it doesn't automatically pull them into the pending file once USAS and payroll or once USAS and inventory are both running. They still have to go in and periodically um, pull in from uh, the pending file. So they will need to do that. Um, so one thing to, to kind of keep uh, track of is um, their starting date and what they're putting in there. So um, is the starting date looking at the PO date or the invoice date? Um, it should be the invoice date. Um, I'm pretty sure that, sh that it would be looking at the invoice date to um, uh, pull that information in. Um, so yeah, that, that should be it. I'm gonna double check that, but yeah. And if I don't have that in the documentation, I'll make sure I make note of that. Um, the other thing you're gonna see in here is an include rejected. And so um, what that means is, let's say I went in and I pulled from the beginning of this fiscal year and I populated my pending file and I realized that I entered in the wrong date. And so when you pull from USAS, um, what it does then is it um, shows those then um, once they're pulled over into inventory, it's going to mark them then in USAS as uh, rejected. So that meaning that um, they've been pulled over and we don't wanna pull them over again. So once they get pulled over into inventory, those items are marked as rejected in USAS. And um, that's great. But if you made a mistake on your date and you kind of want to start over, um, what you can do is, you know, go in here and delete the, you know, delete the pending file, go in and start again with the correct date and check mark that to include those rejected items so they get pulled in again so that does happen it happened to me <laughs> that's why i asked for this because i'm like wait a minute i put in the wrong thing and now if i try to pull it in again it's showing rejected and won't pull it in again i need to pull it in again because i put in the wrong date and so that's when they came up with this include rejected uh check box so um, so yeah, so you can include those ones that were rejected and pull it in again. And that's what that's for. I know we've had questions about, um, I'm going to go back to the pending chapter, about going in and pulling from USAS and I'm not getting anything. You know, it's pulling and I'm getting this error and it's saying no items found. And that's where you kind of have to do a little digging as to why. And my first thought is, that EIS configuration information as part of the post USAS steps wasn't performed. That's the first thing um, that I would think as to why your pending information isn't getting pulled over. And so um, I have down here in the pending items chapter, uh, this, uh, you know, basically explaining that. And if it doesn't re return in any results, um, you need to check those, um, the module and the configuration settings to see if they were set up originally. And another thing that you can do to confirm that as well is to go into AP invoices and do an advanced query to search for items that have been marked for inventory. And the way to do that is when I get into advanced query over in properties, there's an items option. And when I click on that drop down, there's an inventory item field. 
And so when I double click on that, it'll pull it over in my display name equals true. So basically this is saying, find any items in AP invoices that are marked for inventory. And so once I do that, I can also save this um, uh, filter, um, but I wanna click on apply query. And if I do get a bunch of items that are showing as marked for inventory in here, um, then, and they're not pulling over, then we got to look at, you know, plan B here to see why they still aren't getting pulled over. Now, obviously, if you don't get any uh, return on this, um, then that's probably a good indication that the uh, integration module and the configuration information was never set up um, when they started in USAS. Um, but have no fear. We are aware of that. Um, we do have a USSR issue that is on our roadmap this year. I don't, it doesn't have a scheduled date yet, um, but what this will allow um, you to do is it will find those invoice items that have met the pending threshold, um, but did not get marked for inventory and it's going to mark them so that they can get pulled into the inventory application. So um, that is, I've got the um, JIRA number here actually, 4726. So if this is something you'd like to see done sooner rather than later, then um, I think it might be worth mentioning like on a prioritization call um, to get this taken care of. Um, so I just at this point don't know how many um, districts did not set this up. Um, but obviously, if um, they aren't migrating over and they're starting fresh from, you know, uh, starting new in the redesign, this is something that can be set up whenever in USSR. But that's basically how those, you know, talk to one another. It's based on whether that item has been marked for inventory. And the pending file will then go out there and find those and pull them in. So that's basically the pending information in a nutshell here, how that works. I go back to my grid here. And so in the pending file grid, then once I populate this, I can go in and clean it up if I need to. If there's some silly little stuff in here that should not have been pulled over for some reason, I can go in, check mark that and click on delete and it will delete that. Or I can just click on the delete icon um, and it should delete it as well. Um, I think we may have a little bug with this one right now. This may not be working the actual icon. So I think that's one of the JIRA issues we have um, to fix that. Um, but definitely you can do the check box and delete those particular items that you aren't planning on um, creating tags for. So, it, and, you know, and I think they just need to get in the habit like they did in classic is to keep this as clean as possible um, and um, go in and, you know, delete anything out that they know they're never gonna create a tag for and to keep it current. You know, um, don't have a lot of items out here that are five, six, seven years old. You know, uh, make sure that this is, it's easy to do. It's easy to go in and clean up and delete stuff. So um, there really isn't any reason why, you know, this can't be maintained a little bit better in inventory than it did in classic. So, um, so that's where all that's at. Um, so obviously I can't go in and add items to the pending file. We don't have that capability right now. Um, and I can't go in and edit items on the pending file. So it's got the same capabilities that it had in classic. You can view and you can delete. So obviously viewing means adding and removing columns on my grid. I can't like open up a window to see things in more detail. So again, if there are things that are you feel are missing, your districts feel are missing from the pending item grid that they would like to see added as a column, um, we would appreciate that feedback um, and just let us know if there's something in particular missing. We may have a JIRA issue, a feedback issue written already for it, um, but um, yeah, we can, we can add that information in. Okay, any questions regarding the pending file? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to items. <clears throat> And you'll see though, um, when you are moving around, it's pretty seamless. Sometimes I'm like, I'm still in pending. No, I'm not. I mean, it just, it, it moves you into the next grid so quickly and easily. I have to kind of look up here to make sure I'm in the right spot. So I'm in items now. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to create an item manually um, instead of pulling it from the pending file, just so that you can see uh, what how that's done and just to see the whole process of creating an, an item again. So at this time, I'm going to ignore the pending items and I'm going to add in my next tag. I think it was 191201. And you'll see then that I would just basically have to go in here and fill the information in. And I've got a backtrack here. I'm in fiscal year 20 here. Oops. And if I have an account code I want to add in here, I can. This isn't validating anything right now. Um, so I can put in whatever I want, basically. Um, you could in classic as well, I believe. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and um, I'm not going to put anything in. I don't have anything in here. But um, but if I had a specific um, expenditure account I want to put in here, I can. Same thing with the vendor. Right now, it's not validating the vendor number. I'm just going to type something in. Um, and you'll notice that it doesn't populate the name. I know we do have an issue to validate these. I think a REST service um, JIRA issue has been created for this so that it does validate this information. We just haven't gotten there yet to add that stuff. Um, the PO date, I can populate uh, the purchase order date on here if I wanted to. Um, the amount, I'm definitely going to have to put in an amount here. And then um, if I've got my, you know, PO number, my item number, I do have a PO number. I know it is item number one. And that's about all I know. So I'm just putting in everything manually here. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on continue to item. And again, it pulls up everything. It pulls in some of the stuff that was in the prior. Um, obviously, this does not meet my pending threshold. The amount's under 3,000, so capitalized should not be set. And again, I could go in and select those particular things that are required. So it's following the same protocol that it did in Classic. I just go in and, you know, I need the fund function asset class in here. Um, I need my um, acquisition date populated. Uh, I need my tag number populated. Um, it's purchased. There's my original cost. Um, I am tracking depreciation. And again, based on my category code, it pulled over my life expectancy. Um, it's going to pull in the beginning date, the same as my acquisition date. And so at this point, everything else looks good. I'm going to go ahead and save this item. And it's going to create item 191201. And that's the only acquisition um, that I uh, against that item. So I'm just going to go ahead and close out and close out of my acquisition screen and it should be out here near, now. And there it is. So, um, so just, uh, it, you know, once they get going here, I think it'll go pretty fast for them. You know, they're, especially when they're using the pending file, it's just going to, you know, pull the stuff in, advance to that next screen, add all the rest of the information, if you need to add additional items, you can do it from that screen. If not, close out, close out, you're back. So at the grid. So it's um, pretty basic. Um, what I've done too is in the um, manual, I'm gonna go back to the manual here and I'm gonna go to the appendix. I have a general procedures um, chapter that was that we created, and I've got like just general processing steps, very basic, but straight to the point, not doesn't have all the fluff. I'm going to go ahead and do something real quick to turn off my notifications. Sorry. Um, but I'm going to go to the items one here. And this is what I'm talking about, you know, for those new users um, who just want basic, how do I go in and process a new, how do I add a new item? It has like direct steps here on what they need to do. Um, is there, a, I got a question here, is there a plan to flag the required items? 
So um, Heidi, I'm not sure if you're talking about those, you know, I, those particular, when I'm in the items uh, window um, and I don't put in a fund or a function, does it error out? Um, if that's your question, um, it, it's correct. Um, it will flag um, an error out on those particular ones that the system deems required. So if I'm missing my fund, when I try to post that item, I'll get a little red um, it'll go down to that field and basically give me an error and saying you must enter in a fund. So um, it will have that information um, available. Um, so like item category is not a required field, so you won't get a warning on that, um, but you will get a warning if you're missing a fund, function, asset class, um, the original cost, the actual tag number. So you will get errors on that. Okay, and so so this is where we're at right now with like processing. Um, so if I you know want to use the pending file, these are the steps. So if this is something you want to direct to your end users to say they have just a real quick sheet of how to process um, an item, and it kind of goes through those basic steps. Now. Um, we are in talks. In fact, I met with um, someone from the Management Council earlier uh, this week to do something a little bit uh, fancier uh, with screenshots and stuff like that, that basically is an interactive guide to show them how to create an item. And so we are in the process of starting that and we're hoping to have something available um, within the next month or two, I, our goal is to have it available before April um, in order to basically do this in an interactive guide where they're basically going in and it's just showing them this is what you need to do. So if you've got a new user who's coming in doing inventory for a district and they're like, how do I process an item? You, you give them that interactive guide and, and show them this is how you do it. Um, and it will take them through the steps. Um, so I haven't seen like, I've seen a couple um, results from other departments in the Management Council, and it looks pretty neat, you know, what they're doing is, you know, just going in and, and just giving them a better way of training, you know, those um, end users on how to use um, the system. And so, you know, we thought we'd start with inventory here um and test it out here and see how it goes and if we get a positive response then we could look eventually to use SAS and payroll um, but that's kind of where we're at right now so i know i've mentioned this to you guys before and um you know we are planning on doing that with the management council and have something out there soon but for now we've got these little you know quick uh, simple ways um, that um, not a whole lot of explanation but just the steps and how to get something done um, so we've got one for items, acquisitions, dispositions, and transfers. Okay, any questions on that? All right. I'm going to go back into, I'm in my items grid, and I'm going to show you guys um, about the splits. Yes, and, Bo and Bonnie just asked, can you talk about splits? That was next on my list. So let's talk about splits. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a particular tag here. <laughs> You're welcome. And so this is a current existing tag that I have. And you'll see that the number of items is 12. And so what I want to do is I want to take this and I want to split it out into individual tags. So in order to even see the split option, I have to view the item. So I'm going to click on my view. And now you'll see the split. And so from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on split and I get this basic screen and it knows the original tag because that's the one I'm viewing. It's thinking I want to start with that tag as my beginning tag to split. But we have one little caveat here when it comes to splitting. In the redesign, if I'm going to split and start with 111, then the next 12 tags cannot be on this system. So those have to be available tag numbers. Now, if 112 is on the system already, um, I'm gonna get an error. 
So that's one thing right now, the way that this works is that they have to ensure that um, the 12 tags that I wanna split into are tag numbers that aren't currently being used in the system. So I know in classic, it would skip over those and just move on to the next one, but redesign isn't able to um, process that right now. So it has to, you have to know that th those next 12 numbers are open. Um, and so to ensure that here, I don't know, um, I should have probably looked ahead of time, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put in a beginning number that I do know, uh, put in 300. And so what's gonna happen then is um, it's gonna start with tag number uh, 191 300. I know that 300 through, it'd be 311, because I'm talking about 12, 300, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, 3, 311, um, aren't being used on the system right now. And so I do have to put in the new number and we are gonna fix this here. So it shows the complete description up here. And so I do have a projection here. And so this is gonna allow me um, to ensure that this is gonna work. And you'll notice that an option down here says validate input. It doesn't say split yet because it's checking to make sure that these tag numbers aren't in use. So I'm gonna do the validate input. I didn't get an error. So if I received an error um, saying that maybe 191301 is already used, I would have received an error saying that. Um, but it looks like that all went through well. So I can go ahead and click on split. And again, I'm still just doing a projection here. And it's gonna go out there and create a report. And it's called split report by default. They can save it to whatever they want. And I'm gonna pull that up. And it's going to show me the actual tag that I'm planning on splitting and then the um, items that it's gonna split into. So 300 to 311. Um, and you'll notice too, that it pulls in um, the organization and the location codes right now from the original tag. We don't have the capability to make those changes right away. I know in classic, they could go into that split screen before they post the split and make changes. So at this point, this is how it works. And if they need to go in and change those organization location codes, add serial and model numbers, they could query this particular, these tags, export them out, make those changes in Excel, import the updates. So that is available. It's just not available in the, in the UI here. So um, this projection looks good to me. So what happens to the original tag number? It gets removed. So um, that will no longer be on file. So 111 will be removed from the system. And I believe it did the same thing in Classic as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and X out of my report. You notice it takes me back. And so my projection looked good. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and uncheck and actually split them. And again, I will create another report. And this report's going to probably show, it doesn't say projection anymore, it just says actual. If I go back in here, I'm going to go ahead and close out of this. And I know that 191 still shows here, but once I close out of here, and I think at this point, I think we're looking on, on cleaning this up a little bit, um, because if I go in and try and do a search, 191, 111, oh, we did clean it up. <laughs> So obviously um, it's not on file anymore, but the others are. So 191, uh, I think I put in 191-300. So um, here's 191-300. And so obviously my original cost now is $24.99. It was a capitalized asset when it was one. But now that I've split it out, it no longer meets my $3,000 threshold. So you'll notice that the capitalized says false now. Um, and if I just view this particular one, um, it's showing on here. 
So uh, another question, can the original tag number 191111 be reused? Yes. So it's not out there, it's gone. Um, so that tag number can be reused. And that's basically how you do a split. Um, so like I said, if you know you did want to change some of this, like the location, you know, serial and model numbers, you could, you know, enter in. This is one thing too. I think we're working on some type of range um, to be able to, if I go in and do this, there we go. Um, so I guess this is kind of a range. Um, I can go in and select, you know, I entered all of these. These are my splits. And I could extract these out, like I said, into an Excel spreadsheet. I'd, I'd like, I would think you'd want to do Excel um, in case there are leading zeros in your tag numbers to retain those. Because, you know, once you get into Excel, um, you pull in a CSV file in Excel, it drops the leading zeros. Um, so I would think your file type should be Excel to begin with. And you go ahead and save that. I can pull it into Excel, just so you guys can see what this looks like. And it is pulling in um, everything. Um, not just what's on my grid. I think I told you guys that it just pulled in what's on your grid, but it doesn't. It pulls in everything. Um, and so at this point then, if I needed to put serial and model numbers in, um, then that's great. I'm gonna go ahead and expand this. I could put those serial and model numbers in here. I could go over and change my locations. I could go in and change my... Um, organizations, whatever needs to be changed that can be changed, those you know optional fields, um, I would go in and make those changes. Could I go in and change a fund and function? I hope not, um, because those would be like transfer transaction type of things that need to be handled. Um, but some of this other updating of these uh, fields, these optional fields, you can go in and make those changes. And then you'll notice too, I'm gonna slide back over to the beginning, you see this ID field, you're going to see that when you're pulling information out of the system, um, it's that ID field related to that particular item and you don't wanna delete it. So you wanna leave that on here because that's how it talks back to the item and makes the updates. Um, so you would just kind of leave that alone, you know, enter in what you need to save this. And then obviously you would go in then to our system import and you would go in and upload that newly saved file. When you save that Excel spreadsheet, you need to save it as a CSV. So once you make all those changes, save as a CSV format, upload it in here. You're going to select items because that's the you know, um, transactions that you want to update and update records. Um, oh, we do have an option, I'm sorry. Um, if you do change the fund function or asset class, you can leave this checked um, as create transfers and it will create transfer transactions at the same time for those. Um, and then, you know, anything else in here, click on import and it goes out there and makes those changes to those existing items. So that is one way, you know, when you're doing a split to mass update those split tags in those specific fields. Okay, and we will get into this, the import stuff in more detail in a couple of weeks, but I just kind of wanted to show you a preview of what that, how that behaves. I'm going to go back to items. And the other thing I want to show you guys on items, um, items is where we're really focusing because there's just a lot of information on here. The rest of the um, menu options and transactions goes pretty quickly. Um, the depreciate, I do want to talk about depreciate because um, I think you know the same caution that was used in classic to depreciate um, should be used in redesign as well. And that's in regards to like the history of the item. And um, I'm gonna go back to the menu here or to the manual and just talk about, um, I'm gonna go back to transactions and items just to show you that we do have a little bit of information regarding depreciating in here, 
um, and just talking about historical versus recalculated depreciation and how it could get affect how it could get affected um, if you use that depreciate option in redesign, just like it did in classic. And so, and I have an example down here of what I mean. And so in here, if I um, wanted to increase the original cost of a depreciating asset. So this really gets into when you've got multiple acquisitions that you've added throughout the life of that tag. That's where it could mess up or just uh, change the depreciation, I guess, not mess it up, but just change it um, to reflect um, that it's basically being tracked, the history of it's being tracked differently now. And so what I mean by this is that, suppose you do increase the original cost of a depreciation depreciating asset by adding an additional acquisition. So I have a tag out there, computer, with an original cost of $1,000. Um, and it's being depreciated over eight years. So after four years, I went in and added uh, an additional memory of $400. And so now my original cost of that item is $1,400. So for those first four years, that computer was being depreciated at $125 a year um, for a total of you know, $500, um, so a half of its useful life. But since I just increased the value, it's changing that now, and I increased it by 400 to $900. Um, and so, and that amount then will de be depreciated over the remaining four years. So after my upgrade, the next four years, it will depreciate at 225. However, if I were to go in and run the depreciation on that item, after that additional um, acquisition, it is going to basically, it's not gonna know that I've had several acquisitions throughout the life of this item. It's just gonna take that value of $1,400 and depreciate it over eight years for $175. So, um, so that's where you know, I just wanna explain that it will change it. Um, that's not an issue, that's fine. But I just feel like that's something um, that should be discussed with, you know, the districts just to let them know the impact of running that depreciation um, option. And so with that depreciation option, I do have a particular tag here. And I think we all know, you know, the life to date depreciation amounts in their classic files. Are those correct? I don't know. I don't know. It depends on, you know, if it's, you know, created on the system um, by adding the item in classic and it's been depreciated every year out, then yes. But what if they're importing um, items through a spreadsheet and they're putting in a life to date amount? What is that life? Is that valid? Is that correct? And now it's stored on that item in classic. So um, assuming it is, and if it is, then um, if uh, you know an order comes in and says that life to date is off, probably assuming because of some type of import that was done, um, and I'm talking classic, um, then you know they want the district to update that life to date to what it should be. And so um, if I go in, I'm going to look at one of these here. I'm going to view this particular tag. And so the life today on this tag right now is, is 1048.47. And so how the um, how it's depreciated works the same that it does in classic. So on the system, it's going out there and looking at the beginning depreciation date. It's taken into consideration the original cost and the number of years, the useful life. And so I've got a ban I've got a original cost of 62.17.97. And you divide that um, by um, seven years, and that comes out to, and I have this marked, $888.28 for yearly depreciation. 
So this was acquired in 2017. I'm currently in fiscal year 2020. This is part of fiscal year 2018. So from August through June of fiscal year 2018, I, that's tracking the depreciation for that fiscal period. So it's not a full year, I'm missing a month. Um, so it's basically um, 11 months there times whatever the uh, monthly depreciation. So basically um, that 888, um, 28, I divide that by 12 months to give me $74 and change times 11 months would be my depreciation for 2018. And then 2019, I would have a full year at that 888.28. So I'm currently in 2020, so I don't have depreciation yet for that year. So I've got two years and that total amount uh, for those two years, the life to date should really be 1702.57. But it's not showing me that in here. That's being brought over from classic. And so um, if I want to go in and change this, um, I could go in and um, do the calculation myself like I just did and edit this and change the depreciation. Or I could actually go in and depreciate it by um, letting the system take care of it for me. And so if I click on this particular one and click on depreciate, it's always going to run a depreciation report. And this is what I like, like, like about this option is that I can select a particular item and do a projection. Classic, I couldn't. It was all or nothing. Um, it just pulled up all items. Um, and I would always have to do a projection um, in order to get that calculation. Then I had to go in and edit the item and item screen and change the life to date. Here, you don't have to. I can just select that particular one, still do a projection. And it's going to come out here and give me my before, my after, which is the 1702 we were talking about, and the difference. And again, this is just a projection. Um, that should be said on the report. I'm going to make note of that. We have it in the split, but we don't have it in here, so I need to make sure we do that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and X out of that report. And then obviously, if I want to actually go in and make the update, I can uncheck that. Oops, oops. I did wrong there. I should be able to uncheck that and click on generate. Um, and it will go out there then and update the life to date with that new figure. Seventeen oh two fifty seven. Seventeen oh two fifty seven. So it's been updated. Is that calculation in the manual? No, but it will be. <laughs> um, there are still some things in the classic system. Some excellent reference material in there that needs to be brought over into um, the redesign that really doesn't have anything to do with the software per se, but just good like explanations. And that's one of them. Um, so <clears throat> that is something that we're going to include. I don't have that in, um, in here yet. So, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have like a separate like um, I'm not sure where I'm going to put that yet, but we definitely, you know, we've had it in classic, so it needs to be in redesign as well. So uh, we'll make sure that we get that um, in here somewhere. So those are, I know that was a lot, but I know, I mean, that's why I wanted to do this uh, session on just the transaction menu because the items was going to take up most of it. And that's why I started with items because there is a lot. But, you know, when you really think back to, you know, what we're doing in here, um, it's very easy to, you know, get this stuff accomplished, create items, update items, depreciate, split. So it's all there. Um, and it's, you know, all on this nice grid. So Okay, um, just to talk about the others real quick, acquisitions. 
So obviously this is a listing of all the acquisitions against existing items. So, so some of these could have several acquisitions. And so in order to create an acquisition, the item must exist. It will give you an error if you put in a tag number that currently isn't on the system. Um, so you have to have that tag in there. And so I'm gonna pick on one here. And again, I can pull from the pending file as well. So I can go in there, pull something in, and um, basically once it populates it, I think I might have one here. I'm gonna pick on one. I'm gonna pick on this first one here. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this in and add it to an existing tag. And the tag is 391601. Um, and so it's you know obviously gonna go in and fill in everything. And by default, it is going to pull in uh, the original cost on that. Um, and then from there, I click on create it's going to create the tag, or I'm sorry, it's going to create the acquisition and, and include it in here. And then when I go into item screen, because I'm sorry, when I go into items, because I updated the original cost, it's going to increase the original cost by this amount. Um, so I know we're kind of you know, short on time here, but um, that's basically in a nutshell what it's going to do. So um, if this item didn't exist, and I pretty sure it does. I'm going to click on create and see what happens. There we go. Um, so um, it does pull that in there then. Um, and then if I would go in and look at that tag and item screen, um, that amount then would, would increase by the $469.99. So um, obviously, if this is like a payment um, type that doesn't affect the original cost, you know, when I was adding this, I could go in and click on this and select payment, uncheck the update original cost, and it would still create the acquisition, but it wouldn't update the original cost on the item. Is there any way to have a drop down of existing tag numbers or something so you know you're picking an existing item? Um, that's a good uh, question. That's a good feedback um, question. So um, I will see, I don't believe we have a Jira issue for that already. Um, um, but I will um, see if that's something that can be done. So that's a, that's a good one, Larry. So anything else with acquisitions? I mean, it's pretty basic. You're just going in, whether you're pulling it from the pending file, letting it populate, um, and then clicking on add, or you know, going in and entering the acquisition information manually and clicking on add. Okay. Um, dispositions. So here is the disposition grid, which I like so much better than disposition tr transactions in classic. And so obviously we can create dispositions for existing items. And we can do mass disposing of assets through the system import. So we'll get to that in a couple weeks. But for now to do it manually, I would again click on create and again you can change up your um, options in here so you know your grid looks the way that you know you want it to. So if I click on create here um, it's going to ask me for the tag number so this tag number must exist so hopefully this one does. And once I hit tab you'll see that it pulls in all the information about that tag and then from here. I'm in 20 and um, it pulls in the description. If I received an amount, this is an informational uh, window. If I received an amount for this, I could put this in here. Um, my disposition codes, it's gonna go out there underneath core dispositions and basically display the codes that are available. So I can say that this has been sold. Um, who authorized it? Um, so I can put in maybe the treasurer's uh, name or the superintendent or whoever authorized this from being uh, disposed. You'll notice that it pulls in the fund function and asset class from the item. And it also has the error adjustment flag in here too. So if this should have been disposed last year, um, I can check the error adjustment 
And if this is a capitalized asset, it would show um, underneath the adjustment column on the 103 and 104 reports instead as a true disposition for that year. Um, so that's what that error adjustment's doing. It's behaving the same way that it did in Classic. So at this point, I can click on Create and it will post that. And if I go back and look at this tag number underneath items, it should say disposed of in the status. That's the really, I think the only thing that's gonna change on the item record is the status. Um, I'll go ahead and go into transfers. The last thing we're gonna cover. And again, transfer transactions in classic, that's basically what this is. I click on create to create one and it brings up this box. And here it does have the item tag number that we can select from. So that is a possibility, Larry. We're able to do it with transfers. I'm wondering if we're able you know, have that, add that ability, ability to the other programs. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and type in, I'm just gonna type one in. And it's gonna pull in the uh, original cost of that item. Change my date. And what type of transfer am I gonna do? Am I changing the fund, the function, or the asset class? So I'm gonna change my function. And you'll notice it displays the old value. I just put in the new value. And again, it has a drop down that I can pick the one that I want. Again, if this was a transfer that should have been uh, handled in a prior year, I can click on the error adjustment. And again, if this is a capitalized asset, it's going to show in the adjustments column and not the transfers column on those change schedule reports. And I click on create and it creates that transfer transaction. And so if I look at the item that um, is tied to this, the function code should now reflect the 2750. Okay. All right. Well, that's basically um, the transactions menu in a nutshell. I really wanted to focus on items because there's a lot to it, whereas the other three, not so much. And we did talk about the pending um, already in detail earlier. So do you guys have any, any questions about any of this? Hey, I don't see anything in chat. Um, again, I appreciate you guys um, it's taking the time today to cover this with me. And um, like I said, I'll look into a few of these things and see that uh, uh, see what we can do about some of this. Uh, maybe create a couple of Jira issues based on what we discussed today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again in a couple more weeks and we can get into uh, the imports. So thanks again. We'll see you soon. Thank you.